Hello YouTube, how is it going? It is the professional here. So as I told you guys, I was working on a World War I documentary in relation to Battlefield 1, and it is finally finished. This is a very different video from what I normally do, as you guys will see. Many of you will also understand why it took me so long to make this. It took me two months to make this documentary. I made this documentary for Battlefield 1 players who love the game, but may not know the history well. I love history, and I have taken several courses in college on it and read many sources, especially on World War I. World War I is one of my strongest subjects. However, the majority of my view of the war came from my own research and reading because high school and college did not teach you the whole story, and I will explain what exactly school lied to you about the war. As I played Battlefield 1, I realized there are many players who do not know much about this war or what caused it. Many people have this generalization in their minds that since Germany invaded and took over countries in World War II, this was the same in World War I. It wasn't. This is a false generalization. World War II, almost everyone knows how it started, ended, and who caused it. But World War I is a completely different story, and many people do not know what started this war. I thought I would explain it in this documentary. World War I is not simple like World War II. It is an extremely complicated war and conflict. When you guys watch this documentary, you are going to realize just how complicated this war really was. To this day, historians argue about what really caused this war, and who caused it. I am going to try to answer the question. Who caused World War I? We are going to be looking at all the major countries involved in this war and try to be as neutral as possible. I will not be taking sides, and we will be looking at it from the perspective of each country in the war. It does not matter who won the war or who was blamed, because that is irrelevant. What's relevant is who caused this conflict. We are going to be looking at this war from the start, and I am going to be discussing each country's role, and in this investigation, I will give you my opinion on who really started this war and who was responsible. If anybody watching this took World War I in school, I will cover many things you already know, but I will most likely shock you with many things you did not know. I hope that in this documentary I can teach you something about the war you may not have known. When I asked many Battlefield 1 players who they thought caused it, I got various answers from Germany, to Serbia, to Austria-Hungary, to Russia. Very few shared the same opinion as me, and I will back up my opinion with historical facts on why I think it is true. Battlefield 1's historical codex entries give good backstory on the war, but none really talk about what caused the war and how it started. Here we begin our investigation into who started World War 1. We will find the culprit, and I will explain why they are responsible. I will answer the question of the century, and the answer may shock you. World War 1 needs to be taught from a non-biased perspective, and you will realize why it's extremely important to teach in relation to today. Hopefully this gives you a greater understanding of the war and what caused it. Enjoy. Okay, so in order to determine who is responsible for World War I, we have to look at a map of Europe pre-World War I. This is a map that I found, and this map takes place a few months before the war broke out, early 1914, and it also includes the Russian allies of Serbia, which many maps don't show. A lot of maps, they just focus on the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente. They don't show the Russian allies of Serbia, so this map is really well done. And if you take a look at this map, Europe looks very different than it does today. There are many countries that don't exist on this map, and they're instead occupied by other powers. There are also many countries who have more land today, or less than they did in 1914. So first, let's take a look at the Triple Entente. This was formed in 1907 and consist consisted of mainly France, the UK, and Russia. The other alliance is the Triple Alliance, and this was formed in 1882 between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. The Triple Alliance is not the same as the Central Powers, which many mistake it for. The Triple Alliance is instead the precursor to the Central Powers. What happened was that Italy was originally part of the Triple Alliance, but then in 1915 they left. For the first year of the war, they stayed neutral and claimed that the war was a that the alliance was a defensive purpose, and they claimed that Germany caused it, so that they, they did not have an obligation to back up Germany and Austria-Hungary. Instead, they joined the Triple Entente in 1915, declaring war on Austria-Hungary. And when Italy officially left, and it was just Germany and Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, which the Ottoman Empire joined in August 1914, then it became officially the Central Powers. So, in case you guys ever see Triple Alliance, it's the precursor to the Central Powers. And just because Italy claimed that Germany caused the war and was the aggressor does not necessarily make this true. So we are going to look at all the countries involved and determine which country has the most to blame or what countries have the most to blame. So let's take a look at this, and here I'm going to talk about a little history going back before World War I that's very important to the start of the war. One major conflict that we need to look at to understand World War I tensions are the Franco-Prussian War 
and this war took place 44 years before World War I, and this was between France and the North German Confederation. If we look at this map here, and this is from 1870, Germany is split into many different smaller states. The largest and most powerful one was Prussia, which unified the northern German states into the North German Confederation. Otto von Bismarck, who was appointed Minister President of Prussia by Kaiser Wilhelm I, the grandfather of Wilhelm II, wanted to unify Germany into one single state. The lower German states would not unify, and Bismarck knew that he needed a way for them to unify Prussia. He thought of the idea of provoking a war with France in order to have the southern German states join Prussia. France at this time was an absolute monarchy, with Napoleon III as emperor. He was the nephew of Napoleon I, who almost conquered all of Europe during the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon III was a failed emperor, however he wanted to be just like his uncle and rebuild the French Empire. Bismarck knew that if he provoked him, he would attack to seek glory on the battlefield. There was already rising tensions between France and Prussia after Prince Leopold, a Prussian prince, was offered the Spanish crown. The French felt extremely threatened by this because if a Prussian were to be the Spanish monarchy, they could encircle France with Spain to its south and Prussia to its east. After France protested over this, Leopold eventually dropped his bid to the throne. However, this was not good enough for France, who demanded promises from Wilhelm that Prussia would never send one of its own to be the monarch of Spain. The French ambassador, Count Banditti, had a meeting with Wilhelm, who then sent a report of this meeting to Bismarck. Wilhelm had described Banditti as annoying and did not take him seriously. Bismarck edited this telegram to make it seem more insulting towards France. He then released it to the press, and the French declared war three days later. This was a very large war for the time period, and hundreds of thousands of people died. Once the war started, Bismarck's plan was a success, because the southern German states of Bavaria, Baden, Württemberg, and Hesse-Darmstadt joined on Prussia's side. To sum it up, this was a, a tactical disaster for the French, who suffered much higher losses than the Prussians. Napoleon III was also captured in battle, and he was forced into exile. France lost its emperor, and it was forced to pay huge debts to Prussia. The worst for the French was the loss of Alsace-Lorraine, which was annexed by Prussia. If you play the operations in the French campaign in Battlefield 1, when they claim, we will take back the Lorraine, this is the land that they are referring to. France is humiliated, and Prussia and its southern allies formed into one state called the German Empire. Bismarck's plan was a major success, and whether or not Bismarck was a good person is another argument, but he was a very smart man. The reason that this war is so important is it explains where the Germany of 1914 came from, and why the French hated the Germans so much. And the British also felt threatened by the new German Empire, especially after they started going after colonies in Africa. For centuries, the British and the French were rivals, but they put their differences aside to ally against Germany, who they saw as a greater threat to their empires. Now that we have some backstory as to why there was tensions between France, Germany, and Britain, let's discuss the start of the war and what happened. The war as we know started in Austria-Hungary. Sarajevo, as you guys see in this map, is part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, unlike today where it is the capital of Bosnia. What many people do not understand is that these empires did not just colonize and oppress Africa and Asia, but Europe itself. These big empires often picked on smaller European peoples and took them over. These lands were separate from their colonies because they had annexed these lands directly into, into their empires. So while these empires, they oppressed colonies in Africa and Asia, they also conquered a lot of smaller European peoples. That's why a lot of the countries like Poland, Croatia, Bosnia, you know, those countries, they don't exist on the map because they were conquered by these empires and subjugated by them. So whenever people, people often say that it's Europeans who colonized the whole world, not all Europeans. There were many people that were European people that were colonized themselves, like me being Polish. My people, my ancestors were occupied and were victims of colonialism and imperialism as well because these empires had completely divided up Poland into the Austrian part, the Russian part, and the German part. So these three empires literally carved up my ancestors' lands. So, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, it was one of the most multicultural, um, multicultural countries in Europe, and it had people such as Poles, Serbs, Croatians, Bosnians, Czechs, and Romanians, and the, the empire even had a total of 15 languages that it recognized. The Austrian-Hungarian Empire it treated conquered people better than other empires, however they were still imperialist. An example of this from my perspective being Polish is that the Russian Empire, the parts that it occupied in Poland, they often made it illegal to speak Polish, so it was illegal to speak Polish and instead they pushed Russification on Poles. And the Russian government o o promoted Russian orthodoxy a lot and discriminated heavily against Roman Catholics who was the dominant religion of Poles. 
and in the German Empire's part of Poland, Poles were often forced to change their names to Germans. So, if you were a Pole living in German-occupied uh, Poland, you were often forced to change your name to German. So, if you had a Polish name, they would often the government would often require you to change your name to be German. However, you were oftentimes people were still allowed to be, practice Roman Catholicism. In the Austrian-Hungarian part, Poles were free to have Polish names, practice any religion, and speak Polish. So, in the Austrian-Hungarian part, peoples generally, they had a better standards of living in that empire and were treated more fairly than in other empires. However, the Austrian-Hungarians were still imperialists and they were still occupying these countries and not giving them the right of self-determination to govern themselves. And in terms of government, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, it was a dual monarchy, with an Austrian emperor ruling over a Hungarian kingdom as well. But the Austrians, they often fought of themselves as in charge of the empire. And many Austrian nobles were against the Hungarian leadership, who they wanted to subjugate instead of sharing an empire. One man who believed in this and a strong supporter of the empire was Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He was the nephew of Franz Joseph I, the emperor, and the heir to the Austrian throne, since Franz Joseph I did not have any heirs. He did not treat Hungarians equally, and he actually hated Hungarians. Ferdinand even described Hank Hungarians as, quote, this is what he said, the Hungarians are all rabble regardless of whether they are minister or duke, cardinal or burgher, peasant, hussar, domestic servant, or revolutionary. So he really hated the Hungarians, and he even hated Hungarian regiments. His own soldiers who spoke Hungarian and protected his life, he demanded that they speak German. And... This guy was not a good person at all. He represented the typical dying aristocracy in Europe. Many of these aristocrats often believed that they were privileged to everything, including leadership, military positions, and wealth, simply based off their family name. Many of these aristocrats were so arrogant that if you were of any peasant background, you could not even speak to them because you were deemed not worthy. Ironically though, Ferdinand's wife came from a poorer Czech aristocratic bloodline, and simply because of this, she was denied royal honors in Austria. So that's how arrogant a lot of the aristocracy was in Europe. And if you think of people who generally think of themselves above everyone and see and and see everyone around them as a puppet, this is what a lot of the aristocrats be believed. Not all of them were like this, but a lot of them, a huge chunk of them basically believed that they were entitled to all these privileges, and they basically saw all the peasants around them as not worthy puppets, kind of like tools. And this is what the aristocracy of the time period beh behaved like, and many of these people were in charge of these empires, and the monarchy shared their behavior. On June 28th, 1914, a day infamous in history, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was visiting Sarajevo, a city occupied by the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. It was not an Austrian or, or Hungarian city, but a Slavic city, with Serbians and Croatians and Bosnians all making claim to the land. The Black Hand was a Serbian terrorist organization who wanted to unify all Bal Balkan Slavic lands into a greater Serbia. Their ideology saw the Austrian Hungarians as a threat to them in that region. They wanted them to leave Bosnia, and this group was no stranger to violence, and its members assassinated the Serbian royal family of Obrenovic, in which later the house of Kar Karadorevic took over, who would ally with Russia. So they simply didn't like this one royal family's political views, and they assassinated their own royal family before. So when Ferdinand's convoy was going through Sarajevo, one Black Hand member threw a grenade, which did not detonate underneath the car, but instead injured an officer and summoned the crowd. Later in the same day, Ferdinand wanted to visit the officer who was injured, but his driver took a wrong turn where 19-year-old Gavrilo Princip, a Black Hand member, was. He saw an opportunity and ran up to the car and shot both Ferdinand and his wife Sophie. Both of them died from their wounds, and Princip tried to shoot himself, only to have the gun wrestled from his hand by the crowd. With Ferdinand dead, there was no current heir to the Austrian throne, which made Franz Joseph I furious. The Serbian government denied having anything to do with the assassination. However, there are many conspiracies to this day that argue that the Serbian government was more involved than it claimed, since the Black Hand had acquired most of its weapons from the Serbian military and had army officers supporting them such as Captain Dragutin Dimitrievic, who was the secret leader of the group. Austria-Hungary was preparing for a war against Serbia. However, Austria-Hungary was unsure if they should invade because they did not want Serbia's ally Russia to act against them, and Kaiser Wilhelm II encouraged Austria-Hungary to be aggressive with Serbia, and assured them that if a war started, even if it brought Russia into it, Germany would fully support them. However, Germany never intended for Russia to enter the war, and thought this would be a deterrent to Russian mobilization. Because of Germany's support, Austria-Hungary felt that they were fully confident in threatening Serbia and sending them an unreasonable ultimatum. On July 23rd, 
1914, Austria-Hungary sent Serbia an ultimatum threatening full invasion if Serbia did not comply. Here I actually found an English translation for the majority of the ultimatum. This ultimatum was designed to be unreasonable. The ultimatum had some reasonable requests such as an investigation and prosecution into those responsible for Ferdinand's assassination. It also requested that Serbia would stop any arms smuggling from we sending weapons into Austria-Hungary. These demands were not unreasonable. What was unreasonable was the others including banning all propaganda and insults against Austria-Hungary, Austria-Hungary having the right to control Serbia's education system. It also forced Serbia to disband nationalist organizations such as Narodna Odbrana, a common nationalist group, and to remove any politician or military leader that Austria-Hungary did not like. Lastly, the most outrageous demand was that Serbia allow Austrian and Hungarian military police to occupy it. So to summarize, the ultimatum had some reasonable requests, but it was mostly attacking Serbia and unrealistic. Austria-Hungary did not expect Serbia to follow it. No country would have agreed to these terms. Serbia did agree to the majority of them except the occupation of Serbia by military police and imprisonment of officials Austria-Hungary wanted arrested. Serbia argued that it would need to conduct an investigation before it arrests anyone and did not want a foreign force occupying them. Serbia did restrict speech against Austria-Hungary, removed some officials, and disbanded nationalist organizations. However, this wasn't good enough for Austria-Hungary, who mobilized its troops within 48 hours of the ultimatum, and on July 28, 1914, one month after Ferdinand's assassination, they declared war against Serbia. Russia started mobilizing its troops in masses in response to Austria-Hungary declaring war on Serbia, Russia's ally. During this time, Russia had the largest army in the world. However, it was ill-prepared, and Kaiser Wilhelm II sent Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia, a telegram. In it, he asked Nicholas not to interfere, and said he had no problem with him. Wilhelm tried to use his relation to Nicholas as a sort of friendship to avoid conflict. Wilhelm II of Germany, Nicholas II of Russia, and George V of Britain were all cousins, with the same grandmother being Queen Victoria. However, Nicholas refused to demobilize, and as a result, Germany declared war against Russia. Despite what you hear in school, Germany in World War I was aggressive, but not as aggressive as it was portrayed. You can see here that Germany made some attempt to avoid a conflict with Russia. Nicholas's closest advisors warned him not to enter a war of Germany, and even his closest advisor, Rasputin, who many believed had psychic powers, warned him not to do so. Rasputin told Nicholas that he foresaw if he entered the war, it would be the end of him and the Russian royal family. Family, a prediction that would later come true. The reason that Nicholas was so aggressive and refused to demobilize is because his own father, Alexander III, was very strict with him as a child. He would call him girly and mock him, calling him weak. Alexander III died young at 49, and he did not have time to fully prepare Nicholas to beat Tsar. Nicholas, because of his upbringing, did not want to seem weak and refused to back down. Not only this, but Nicholas also saw taking at advice even from his closest advisors as being a form of weakness. This was especially the case after his humiliating defeat to Japan in the Russo-Japanese War. He did not want to seem weak and refused to back down and did not want to demobilize. He was escalating the conflict with Germany and he saw in his eyes the best way to reassure Russian strength in the world was to win a war against Germany and Austria-Hungary. When Germany declared war on Russia, this was very, very bad, because now France was entering the war to support their ally Russia, and Britain was allied with France. Britain, while it mobilized, did not engage in fighting with Germany in mainland Europe. They instead assured France that they would sink any German ship that threatened its shores. Britain warned Germany that if it invaded Belgium, Britain would send troops into mainland Europe to fight. Germany sent an ultimatum to Belgium, wanting to use its country's land to invade France. The reason that Germany wanted to invade France through Belgium is because they believed that they could catch the French off guard and flank them. After Belgium rejected this offer, Germany invaded. The British had a treaty with Belgium, which was a neutral country, and declared war on Germany. On August 1st, the day that Germany declared war on Russia, the Ottoman Empire also joined the war on the Central Power side. The Ottomans had signed a secret treaty with Germany and would enter the war if Germany attacked Russia. The Ottoman Empire was hoping to gain land and prestige because their empire had been declining after the, their defeat in the First Balkan War. Bulgaria additionally felt the same way after their defeat in the Second Balkan War. The First Balkan War began in October 1912 when a League of Balkan states consisting of Montenegro, Serbia, Bulgaria, 
in Greece, attacked the Ottoman Empire in the Balkan Peninsula. The goal of the offensive was to liberate Balkan peoples from the Ottomans, who had occupied various ethnicities throughout the Balkan Peninsula. In 1912, the Ottoman Empire had a foothold in mainland Europe. For centuries, the empire had invaded and occupied many smaller people in the Balkans. The Balkan League of Greece, Montenegro, Bulgaria, and Serbia wanted to kick the Ottomans out of this re region and enlarge their own countries. They were successful, and the Ottomans were humiliated when the war ended on May 30th, 1913. However, this war caused problems in the Balkans because in the Serbian-occupied territories, the Serbians discriminated against non-Serbians, and the Bulgarians discriminated against Serbians and Greeks in their occupied lands, and the Greeks did the same to non-Greeks. This greatly contributed to the Second Balkan War, where Bulgaria attacked its former allies, Greece, Serbia, and Montenegro, because they felt they did not receive a fair amount of territory from the First War. This war lasted only only a little over one month from June 30th, 1913 to August 10, 1913. This war was a humiliating defeat for Bulgaria, whose greed cost them even more territory. The reason the Balkan Wars are important to understanding World War I is to understand why Bulgaria joined the Central Powers. It was the last country to join the alliance and did so on October 14, 1915. Its main reason was to get back territory it lost and revenge on Serbia. Bulgaria participated in, in invasions of Serbia in World War I. What is ironic about the Balkan Wars is that they started out on noble grounds. Greece, Montenegro, Serbia, and Bulgaria wanted to kick the Ottoman Empire out of southern Europe, where it was occupying and oppressing Slavic and Greek peoples. The Ottomans had no right to occupy any of these peoples, but once the Balkan League liberated each of their peoples, they heavily discriminated against the minorities in each of the lands they occupied. And the worst is what they did to Macedonia. Instead of freeing Macedonia, they divided up Macedonia and pretended like the country and people did not exist. Macedonia did not belong to any of them. It did not belong to the Ottomans, or the Greeks, or the Serbians, or the Bulgarians, but to the Macedonian people. The countries who were oppressed historically by the Ottomans became the oppressors themselves. Now that we have focused on the last of the Central Powers, let's focus on Italy. Italy was originally in the Triple Alliance, which consisted of Germany and Austria-Hungary. When war first broke out in Europe, Italy refused to support the alliance, claiming it was for defensive purposes and that the Germans had started the war. For the first year of the war, Italy stayed neutral, refusing to take a side. On April 26, 1915, Italy had joined the Triple Entente, declaring war on Austria-Hungary, which bordered them to the north. The reason that the Italians refused to support the Triple Alliance was not because they claimed that Germany started the war, that was only an excuse they used to stay out of the war. The real reason is, they saw no benefit to the alliance. Austria-Hungary historically had been an oppressor and occupier of Northern Italy. This goes back even as far as the Napoleonic Wars, 100 years before World War I. The Italians instead saw an opportunity to gain more land and prestige by joining the Triple Entente and defeating Austria-Hungary. This would be Italy's main opponent in World War I. The Italians claimed that the Austrians had been occupying their lands. The Italian front was fought mostly in really uneven terrain, very high in the Italian Alps, as we see in Battlefield 1. However, in Battlefield 1, we see this from the Italian perspective, and it is very heroic theme. When we play through the Italian perspective in Battlefield 1, we believe that the Italians are fighting to get back their stolen land. But the question is, did the Italians really have a legitimate claim to the land that they said was theirs? Let us take a look at the lands Italy annexed after World War I, but first, let's discuss what happened that led to Italy gaining this land. During the Battle of Caporetto from October 24 to 19, uh, November 19, 1917, Italy lost 300,000 men. About 270,000 were captured, while the rest were killed, wounded, or missing in action. This is the same battle that, that we see in the Apocalypse DLC in Battlefield 1. After this military disaster, Supreme General Luigi Cardona was replaced by General Armando Diaz. Diaz relied on more defensive tactics until the Italian army was ready for another major offensive. In the months coming ahead, with Austro-Hungarian defeats such as, such as at the Battle of Piave River, a successful Italian defense, Diaz launched the Battle of Vittorio Ven Veneto. This battle is also seen in Battlefield 1 as the Iron Walls operation, and started exactly one year after the Battle of Caporetto, on October 24, 1918. The Italians broke through the Austro-Hungarian lines and fully took Monte Grappa, pushing the Austro-Hungarians to the Adriatic coast. That was the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, because Czechoslovakia declared independence as well, and Hungary did in the coming days. 
the Austro-Hungarian government had no choice but to seek peace terms. On November 3rd, 1918, Austria, Hungary, and Italy signed the armistice of v Villa Giusti. This ended the fighting on the Italian front, and Italy annexed sa southern Tyrol and the Austrian littoral. Now the question is, did Italy have a legitimate claim to this land? Let's take a look at the Austro-Hungarian census from 1910 to see who is the majority living in Tyrol and the Austrian littoral. So right here guys, the, I found that the best way to determine if Italy had rightful claims to Tyrol and the Austrian littoral is to see census data from the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1910. So this is a census from 1910 of all Austro-Hungarian territory. And we are going to determine who the majority of the people were that lived on that land. So first, let's take a look at Tyrol. So as we can see from what I said earlier, Austria-Hungary was one of the most one of the most multicultural countries in Europe at the time. Um, Germans, Germans and Hungarians constituted the majority, with Germans being uh, twenty three percent, Hungarians being about twenty percent. But the rest, we had millions of Czechs, Poles, Serbs, Croatians, Ukrainians, Romanians, Slovaks, Slovenes, Italians. So huge chunks of even their army were not Austrian or Hungarian. These were all a lot of the peoples that they conquered. But let's take a look at the areas that Italy said that they had rightful claim to. So first, let's take a look at Tyrol. Tyrol is what Italy claims they had land to. So right here, let's look at Tyrol. Okay, so county of Tyrol. German, 57.3%. Italian, 42.1%. So the, the Italians claimed that this was rightfully theirs. How is that rightfully theirs if the majority of the people are German, not Italian? Not only that, but Tyrol also does not have a history with Italy. It does not have a history of medieval times with Italy. Italy has no history in Tyrol, so how are they claiming that it's theirs? And even if we look at this picture here, let me show you this picture here. So guys, take a look at this map right here, and this is a map of South Tyrol in 2011. It's a census that was conducted there by the Italian government, and South Tyrol is still part of Italy to this day, and 100 years later, the majority of the area is still German speaking to this day. So as you can see from this map, majority is German speaking. There are some parts where the Italians are the majority, but it's very small parts in the south, the part that's red down there. But German speakers are the majority here. So did the Italians really have a claim to Tyrol? No, they didn't. Okay, so now let's take a look at the Austrian littoral. Let's see. Did the, Aust uh, did the Italians have rightful claims to that land? Let's take a look here. Slovenian, Slovenian 37.3% was the main language in the area, Italians 34.5%, Croatian 24.4%, German 2.5%. So Germans were the smallest minority here, and Slovenians, Italians were pretty close to each other. Croatians a little smaller, but Slovenians and Italians are pretty close to each other. Let's go for more in-depth analysis. Let's take a look right here. Okay, so let's take a look right, right down here. Okay, so right here we're going to look at these areas. Okay, okay, so the highest amount of people were Italians, with 356,676 people. Slovenians were 276,398. Croatians were 172,784. Germans were 3% with 29,077. Okay, so let's take a look. Goriza and Gradiska, Slovenians, they were 58%. 154,564. How the hell does, is Italy going to make claims to that? Italians were 90,000, 90, while Slovenians were at 154,000, and the Italians are claiming that this land was rightfully theirs? How? So let's take a look at Tristi here, if I'm reading that correctly. Italians, 51.85%. Slovenians, 56... Uh, 56,845, 24.78%. So, the Italians had claims to Triste. They had rightful claims, and Triste is a city in Italy today. So, this area right here, Triste, Italy had rightful claims to this land. This land was act was Italian. This land the Italians had claims to. They were the majority of the people. They had some ethnic minorities in these areas, but the Italians were well over, well over 50% in this area. Now, let's take a look at Is Istria here, right here. Croatians, 168,184, 43.5% were Italians were, 147,417, 38.1% of the population. But it gets even worse, guys, it gets even worse. When the war finally came to an end with the Treaty of Versailles, Italy claimed that they also had a rightful claim to Dalmatia. 
because that was guaranteed to them in the Treaty of London in 1915 when Italy joined the Triple Entente. Dalmatia, they, cl they wanted claim to Northern Dalmatia. Let's take a look at Dalmatia right here. Look at this. Dalmatia, look. Croatian, 96.2%. Italian, 2.8%. Are they crazy? How is that an Italian claim? How are you going to claim that this is rightfully Italian land when the population is Croatian, 96.2%. There's some Italians, 2.8%, but it's a very, very small mi minority. This land is Croatian. How can they possibly claim that this land is rightfully Italian? It's simple. They were simply trying to build up their own empire, and they were trying to steal land that wasn't theirs, just like Austria-Hungary did. So, did the Italians have claims to the lands that... Uh, they claimed Austria-Hungary stole from them? Yes and no. The majority of the land they didn't have a claim to. Some of the land they did have a claim to. But the majority of the land they didn't. And let us let me tell you guys. What do you guys think? Judging by, judging by what the Bulgarians and the Serbians and the Greeks and the Montenegrins did to the, did to the Macedonians. What do you guys think the Italians did to the Germans that were in Tyrol? And what do you think the Italians did to the Slovenians and the Croatians? In these areas what do you guys think happened to them well the italians did the exact same thing just as the serbians and the greeks and the bulgarians forcibly tried to integrate macedonians on their own land the italians tried to forcibly integrate germans in tyrol and slovenians and croatians in the austrian littoral this process was called italianization here take a look at this italian fascist poster from the early 1920s I tried to translate this poster to the best of my ability online. I know I have some Italian fans, so if anyone can translate this better, let me know in the comments. But what this poster basically says is, It is forbidden in the most widespread way that in public meetings and in the streets of Dignano, that's a city, one sings or speaks in Slavic language. Even in shops of any kind, it must only be used once. Only the Italian language. The police will use persuasive methods to enforce this. Persuasive methods sounds like a threat to me. So imagine this, a foreign army invades your soil and tells you you can't speak your language anymore, you have to speak our language now. And not only that, but you also have to change your name to our names. You can't keep your old names and you can't keep your culture. The Italians were historically oppressed by the Austrians, but what they did here is completely hypocritical. The oppressed became the oppressors again. After being oppressed and occupied for decades, instead of freeing these lands, they annexed them and forcibly tried to have their local population change their culture uh, and language. Thousands of Croatians and Slovenians were forced to change their names to Italian names. Not only this, but in many places they were forbidden from speaking their native tongue. German speakers suffered the same Italianization pro policies, but in later years the Italians went easier on them and stopped them, and the only reason they did this is because of their alliance with Nazi Germany. I am not defending Austria-Hungary by any means. What I am defending is historical truth. The Austro-Hungarians and Italians had no claim to the majority of the Austrian littoral. It didn't belong to Austria-Hungary or Italy, but it belonged to Slovenian and Croatian people where both empires tried to steal their land and oppress them. However, the Croatians and the Slovenians, while under occupation by the Austrians, Hungarians, had much better lives than under the Italians. The Austro-Hungarians were imperialists, but they were smart. They understood that the only way to control such a huge diverse empire was to grant each people equal rights. Slovenians and Croatians were not subject to forced assimilation under Austria-Hungary. They could speak their language and keep their culture. They were still occupied, but their names remained unchanged, and they didn't face widespread discrimination like under the Italians, so actually it became worse for them when the Italians occupied them. Additionally, these people organized into the state of, of Slo Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs in 1918 and had declared their independence. Italy didn't recognize this new country and would send troops to occupy parts of their country. Later in 1920 with the Treaty of Rapallo, the state of Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs was recognized by Italy and the country had regained some territory, but Italy had stolen land, and a perfect example of this is Zadar, which is a Croatian city that Italy annexed. Half a million Slavic peoples were still occupied by Italy. This state would later become Yugoslavia. Now, let's discuss the Empire of Japan and their role in World War I. 
Under the policy of Sakoku, Japan was isolated for over 200 years. This policy forbid foreigners from entering Japan and also prevented the Japanese from leaving either. It was basically a form of isolationism. The punishment was often uh, met with the death penalty. When the Japanese saw the extent of European colonialism in Asia and after the Chinese military disasters in the Opium Wars, they knew they had to industrialize. This was, was further reinforced when Commodore Matthew Calbriff Perry arrived in Japan twice, once in 1853 and the other in 1854 with American warships that were far more powerful and advanced than Japanese ships. He promised Japan wealth through trade if they opened up a relationship with the United States or forcible trade if they resisted. The reason that the United States wanted a relationship with, with Japan was because European empires were rapidly expanding in Asia and Japan was left untouched. The Japanese agreed to end the policy of Sakoku and opened their ports to American ships. During the Meiji Restoration, Emperor Meiji understood that, that not only did Japan need to open up trade with other nations, but it needed, needed to industrialize and build a modern army. The samurai stood in the way of this and rebelled and were put down. This is familiar to anyone who has seen the last samurai film. In decades following the Meiji Restoration, Japan heavily industrialized and built a huge standing modern army. From Japan's point of view, they saw, saw that the only way to beat the Europeans was to beat them at their own game. Not only did Japan need to industrialize and build an army, but it ne needed to create its own empire. Japan started going after its own colonies. In the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905, which we discussed earlier, Russia was seeking warm water ports to expand its empire and influence. Nicholas looked to East Asia for this and had moved the Russian fleet into Port Arthur, Manchuria. Japan saw Russia as a threat to its sphere of influence in the Korean Peninsula. Japan claimed that it would recognize Russia's influence in Manchuria if Russia recognized its influence in the Korean Peninsula. Nicholas refused and demanded that the Korean Peninsula remain a neutral zone between Japan and Russia. In response, Japan launched a sneak attack against Russia's fleet in Port Arthur and destroyed huge portions of its fleet. In the next year, the Japanese would have much success and the Russians would suffer huge losses. Despite Nicholas's advisors suggesting a treaty with Japan, he refused, convinced he could not lose to Japan. Eventually, after so many Russian losses, U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt interfered in the war and, pro and forced Japan and Russia to make peace. The war ended with the Treaty of Portsmouth, with Russia leaving uh, Manchuria and recognizing Japan's claims to Korea. Half of Sakhalin, a Russian island, was also given to Japan. The world was shocked at this time that a European power such as Russia could be defeated by Japan. The reason that this war is important to World War I is for two reasons. It explains why Nicholas never wanted to be hum humiliated again and why he chose to be so aggressive with Germany and Japan's imperial ambitions entering the war. Japan would attack Germany's colonies in Micronesia in 1914 on the side of the Triple Entente and occupy them until 1921 on when they were transferred to civilian control. Japan's greatest victory in World War I would be during the siege of Tsingtao in China in 1914. Germany surrendered their fortress and Japan would occupy Tsingtao until 1922. This could have made a good operation map in the Turning Tides DLC in Battlefield 1. Unfortunately, Japan was not added to the game, only the Ar Arasaka, Japan's rifle, was. Japan also gained a sphere of influence over China. After the war, the Treaty of Versailles, Japan wanted an amendment to the treaty in which it would declare all races of the world equal. It was rejected, and Japan was left out of discussions and territorial changes at the end of the war. This would greatly contribute to Japan joining the Axis powers during World War II many years later. Now, before we unveil our culprit, we need to look at the last major country to enter the war, the United States, my country. The United States stayed neutral during a huge portion of the war until April 1917 when they entered it. Americans were largely against the war when it first broke out. However, some Americans would go off and fight in the war as early as 1914. Many enlisting in the Canadian and British armies and some pilots went to the French army. President Woodrow Wilson campaigned on keeping America out of the war and it was one of the, his main party platforms that won him the presidency again in 1917. During the first two and a half years of the conflict, the U.S. traded with both Britain and Germany, and it was mostly with Britain. The U.S. would even arm both sides. When American ships would sail to Germany, the British would blockade and board them, while the Germans would sink ships going to Britain with submarines. This caused great anger in the, Uni in the United States. The greatest contribution to the United States entering the war was the sinking of the Lusitania and the Zimmerman Telegram. 
let's start with the Lusitania. I'm going to say this flat out. You have been lied to or not told the, to the whole truth. If you have already learned about World War I, you have learned about the sinking of the Lusitania. When I learned this in school many years ago, I was told that it was a civilian ship sunk by the Germans. I learned this in middle school, high school, and even college. The ship was sunk on May 7th, 1915 by a German U-boat, also which were sub known as submarines. When the ship, ship was sunk, it caused outrage in Europe, especially in the UK and, and the United States. The ship departed New York and was going to Liverpool in Great Britain. When the ship was sunk, the Germans declared that their spies informed them that the ship was carrying arms disguised as a civilian ship. The ship was a civilian ship, with 1,198 of the 1,959 people on board dying. This included 128 Americans, which the press at the time constantly put in headlines. The British denied that the ship was carrying arms, and the Germans were trying to justify a, a sinking a civilian ship. They claimed it was a war crime, and a violation of the rules of war. The Germans would continue insisting that the ship was carrying arms, even into the Treaty of Versailles, which ended the war in 1918. The British dismissed it as German propaganda. But was the ship really carrying arms? Were the Germans onto something? Almost 100 years later, in 2008, when the remains of the ship were found off the coast of Ireland, it was found that the ship was in fact carrying munitions. Here, take a look at this manifest for the ship that the media showed at the time to prove that the Lusitania, quote, wasn't carrying ammunition. If we look at this carefully, there is something very, very strange about the manifest. Look at the top and notice the amount of cheese, lard, and butter in comparison to the rest of the cargo. The manifest lists as carrying 217,000 pounds of cheese, 40,000 pounds of lard, and 43,600 pounds of butter. These pictures are from the from Lusitania.net. If anyone wants to learn more about the disaster, they can look at the link below. If we examine it further, the cheese, lard, and butter was not refrigerated, or even in the refrigerated section of the ship. Ships like the Lusitania would take around a week to travel from New York to the UK. If they were really carrying 217,000 pounds of cheese, 40,000 pounds of lard, and 43,600 pounds of butter, would they not go bad before they reached the UK if they were not refrigerated? So why weren't they refrigerated? It's simple, they were disguised as arms. There is more evidence to support this. If we look at the cargo destination of, of the lard, butter, and cheese, it was not headed to some food processing facility, but instead straight to the Royal Navy's weapon testing establishment in Shoeburyness, England. Why would cheese, lard, and butter go to a weapons testing facility? It makes no sense. Not only this, but if you look at this diagram here of the hull of the ship, the circle with the dot dot is where the German torpedo most likely hit. However, passengers re reported that after the initial hit, there was another explosion which sunk the rest of the ship. If it was not for this explosion, the Lusitania possibly could have made it to the shore where it was not far from when it was hit. If we look at this diagram, the torpedo likely hit directly where the cheese, lard, and butter was. I don't think it was food. I think it was artillery shells which caused the blast. Cheese and butter don't cause huge explosions. The original manifest was also altered, because ships would, would often provide a supplemental manifest three days after departure, so when they arrive at whatever country, they would know what's on the ship. People would purposely leave things out. If we, if we look at the ammunition part of the manifest, it says the ship was carrying an additional 1,271 cases of ammunition. The British government claimed they were small cases of ammunition. This is what one of those cases looked like. One of these shells are 13 pounds. These shells were fired from Br British cannons and were intended to hit as many targets grouped together in a small vicinity. How these shells worked is when they hit the ground, they would release the pellet balls in a giant shrapnel explosion. Shrapnel is part of art an artillery shell that goes flying after an explosion. Getting hit by them is often fatal. When it detonates, the shrapnel will fly in different directions. So if it hit a German trench, it could take out multiple soldiers because it would fly in different directions. The British government claimed that this did not count as a ship carrying arms. Are they crazy? Here's a picture of ammo 100 years later that divers found in the Lusitania wreckage. This ammo is 303 caliber produced by Remington, an American arms manufacturer. 303 is also the main, uh, the main round used in the, British, uh, in the British Infantry's Lee Enfield rifle, which was their main rifle at the time. It is estimated that there is 4 million rounds with the wreckage. The German ambassador Count Bernstorff had met with President Wilson and shown him the original manifest. He cited the original manifest to him and showed him the maker, Bethlehem Steel, who made the shells and described the uh, correct amount to him. Wilson ignored this and continued to blame Germany for the sinking. 
President Woodrow Wilson was aware of the supplemental manifest, as well as the original cargo, and he chose to hide this information to push war. He hid the supplemental manifest in the U.S. Treasury Department in an envelope and left it open only for the President of the United States to open. In 1940, President Roosevelt opened this manifest, but it was never released, most likely because at the time Nazi Germany was conquering Europe, and this would have most likely been used as propaganda by the Nazis. In 2012, the supplemental manifest was finally released. Germany had a policy of sinking any ships in the exclusion zone. Here's a picture of the exclusion zone. I know what a lot of people are thinking, if a ship was carrying arms, couldn't Germany have just boarded a ship instead of sinking it? Germany at this time was blockaded by France and Britain. The French and British had a plan to, to blockade and starve Germany out if a war started. The moment the war started, the British used this strategy. Germany originally had not, anticip had not anticipated this would do anything because 80% 80, 80 of their crops were grown in Germany. What they did not calculate was that 90% of the livestock's food was shipped from other countries. Because of this, the livestock starved, and as a result, around 420,000 Germans starved to death during the war. This is why Germany adopted unrestricted submarine warfare. It was their response to the British and French attempting to starve them out. Germany did have a navy, but lacked the same resources as the British. They could not board a ship in the exclusion zone, even if they wanted to, because of the blockade. Their only choice was to sink ships. Despite the German ambassador telling President Wilson that what Britain was doing was against the rules of war, he rejected this. And Germany was right. If you look at the 1856 Declaration of Paris, which was still applied in 1914, it says blockades are okay during war times if they block ports or coasts, but they cannot block from a distance, meaning in the ocean itself. This was a violation of international law on Britain's part. German troops were not often suffering because of this. Sometimes there were shortages, but it was the German civilian public that suffered because of this. As we said before, 420,000 Germans starved to death because of this policy. Here's a perfect example of a German rationing card used for food in the war. Germany gave specific warnings to people attempting to travel to the UK. The warning was simple, do not come. We do not know if the ship you are on is carrying arms or not, and we will have no choice. Here, look at this warning. It says, Notice, travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies, and Great Britain and her allies, that the zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles, that in accordance with formal notice given by the Imperial German government, vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to the destruction in those waters, and that travelers sailing in the war zone on ships Great Britain or her allies to do so at their own risk. Imperial German Embassy, Washington, D.C., April 20. 1915. In this photo, we can see the Lusitania is warned specifically. The media and historical portrayal of the Germans just wanting to ship, sink ships mercilessly is false. They were trying to avoid conflict with the United States. There are conspiracies to this day that the British wanted the Lusitania to be sunk so they could use it as propaganda to drag the United States into war. Winston Churchill, who was first admiralty of Britain at the time, said as quote, It is more, most important to attract neutral shipping to our shores in the hope of especially embroiling the U.S. in conflict with Germany. For our part, we want the traffic, the more the better, and if some of it gets in trouble, better still. As an American, this gets me very angry that they were trying to drag us into a war that did not affect the United States at all, and in fact it was these European empires' problem, not the US's problem. If the Lusitania would have reached Britain and unloaded its cargo, these 4 million bullets and thousands of artillery shells would have killed more people than the sh sinking of the ship. Put yourself in Germany's perspective. The enemy is using civilian ships to smuggle arms. If you don't stop it, thousands of your people will die because of it. When it comes time to choose if it's your people or the enemy's people, you will choose the enemy's people. Anybody in Germany's position would have done the same thing. And they tell, they, they tell you that they wouldn't, they are not being truthful. Germany had a right to stop these ships because they were carrying arms that would kill their people. The victims here are the people who were not told the ship was carrying arms. Would you have gotten on it if you know it was smuggling millions of bullets and thousands of artillery shells? I wouldn't have. People were warned, but they still chose to travel in a war zone. Germany decided to limit its unrestricted submarine warfare from May 4, 1916 until February 1, 1917 when they resumed it. British government documents show that in the 1980s, they were concerned that explosives would be found with the wreckage and it would destroy US-UK relations. They were scared victims' families could sue the British government for lying about the arms. Almost 100 years later, they would not admit to this, and in the, and in the 1990s, the British Navy tried to destroy the wreck to cover it up. 
Proof of this is that the wreck was more destroyed than previously, and a robot submarine had found an unexploded modern death charge on the wreck. They were lying about this for almost 100 years and would still not admit to it. At the time, propaganda claimed that German kids were given a day off from school to celebrate the sinking of the ship, and the Germans were accused of violating international law, when in fact, it was the British who violated international law with their blockade and using civilian ships from a neutral country to ship arms. Now, we are going to be discussing the Zimmerman telegram and the other factor that led the United States into the war. As many of you remember from school, the Zimmerman telegram was a telegram that was sent in secret from the German Forest Foreign Office to the government of Mexico in January 1917. The British had intercepted the telegram and were unsure of whether to release it because doing so would show they cracked the German codes. They released the telegram to Edward Bell on February 19, 1917, who was the secretary of the American embassy in Britain at the time. He then forwarded it to the American ambassador Walter Hines Page. Page then so showed Wilson this with a copy of British cipher codes to prove that the message was genuine. Wilson released the telegram to the press on February 28. The press showed the telegram everywhere and it enraged many Americans. We know from school that the telegram said that Germany wants Mexico to declare war on the, Uni on the United States and then that Germany would help Mexico regain any lost territories in the Mexican-American War. This is what the media pushed, and Wilson backed it. But is that really what the telegram said? Did the telegram really ask Mexico to declare war on the U.S.? Let's read the telegram for ourselves and find out. Here is a copy of the Zimmerman telegram translated in English. Let's read it. This is from Germ the German government to the Mexican government. We intend to begin on the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. So Germany was planning on resuming unrestricted submarine warfare because they told the U.S. that they would limit the amount of unrestricted submarine warfare because U.S. ships have gotten attacked. After the Lusitania incident, we know that Lusitania was carrying weapons, but still it enraged a lot of the public. And Germany agreed to limit limit the amount of unrestricted submarine warfare, but the British and the Americans were still smuggling arms into Britain, so then Germany decided to resume it. So, let's keep reading. We shall end over in despite of this to keep the United States of America neutral. So they didn't want America to get involved in the war, they wanted America to stay neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support, and an understanding on our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. So these are territories that Mexico lost in the Mexican-American War that took place. It took place about uh, 70 years before World War I. And so what Germany basically is saying in this telegram is that if the U.S. breaks its neutrality and declares war on us, we asked the Mexican government to declare war on the United States, and then that Germany would help Mexico regain the lost territory. So when the media says that Germany wanted Mexico to declare war on the U.S. to regain lost territories, only partially true. It's mostly built on a lie. There's a big difference between saying that Germany wants Mexico to declare war on the U.S. and then saying, if America breaks its neutrality and declares war on us, we want you, Mexico, to declare war on the U.S. So Germany did not want the U.S. to get involved. It wasn't asking for Mexico. Mexico specifically to declare war in the U.S. They were just saying, if the U.S. breaks its neutrality and declares war on us, we make you this offer. This is very um, uh, counter to what the media and a lot of politicians were saying at the time. They were saying the opposite, that the Zimmerman telegram was directly asking for, for Mexico to attack the U.S. Complete lies. Let's see here anything else on this. The settlement in detail is left to you. You will inform the president of the above most secretly as soon as the outbreak of war with the United States of America is certain and add the suggestion that he should on his own initiative. Japan uh, to immediate adherence and at the same time mediate between Japan and ourselves. Please call the president's attention to the fact that the ruthless em employment of our submarines now offers the prospect of compelling England in a few months to make peace. So Germany was still con wanted to resume the unrestricted submarine warfare because a lot of the population was starving. And they had a good reason to do unrestricted submarine warfare because they were, there were civilian ships that were disguised that were bringing in 
guns. They were bringing in ammunition to Europe. They were violating international law, being disguised as civilian ships. And Germany didn't want to sink these ships specifically. They told them, do not travel in these waters. If you travel in these waters, we'll have no choice but to sink you. Not defending the Germans here, but we'll look at just look at it from their perspective. Look at what they were trapped in. They were blockaded. Their people were starving. And the enemy kept using civilian ships to smuggle in guns, which is a clear violation of international law. So the telegram completely misled a complete lie that's that what it's founded on. Yes, it does ask Mexico Mexico to declare war on the US, but only if America declares war on Me on Germany first. Very big difference than asking, uh, than asking Mexico to declare war on the US all of a sudden. Very big difference. So Germany, when they resumed unrestricted submarine warfare, they thought that this would enrage the Americans and that the Americans would declare war on them. And so they made this proposal to Mexico. Germany did not want the U.S. to enter the war despite what you're taught in school. They wanted the U.S. to stay neutral. They wanted to focus on defeating both France and Britain. That's what Germany wanted to focus. They didn't want America to get involved in the war. And they they proposed this alliance to Mexico in case America breaks its neutrality so that they would have some type of advantage over America in case America joined into the war. And the United States already broke off diplomatic relations in February with Germany after they resumed unrestricted submarine warfare. And on April 2nd, 1917, Wilson asked the Congress to declare war on Germany. And on April 6th, this was voted. The United States has officially entered World War I. Wilson justified this claiming the world needs to be safe for democracy. We know that the Lusitania was a lie. The Zimmerman telegram was a lie. And this is an even bigger lie. The fact that he's claiming the reason the U.S. is entering the war is to make the world safe for, quote, democracy? Really? That's the reason for entering a world war of empires killing each other? This was a lie uh, as well to justify a war against Germany, claiming that France and Britain were democracies, but Germany was an absolute monarchy that threatened democracy for the rest of the world. That's what Wilson tried to portray Germany as. France and Britain were more democratic, but it, the government of Germany had nothing to do with this. It had nothing to do with it, with it that the fact that Germany was an absolute monarchy. So, if Wilson lied about the Lusitania and the Zimmerman telegram and going to war for, quote, democracy, what was the real reason? Why did he secretly plot a war against Germany despite winning on a platform of keep the U.S. out of the war? Wilson knew he, he needed to sway public opinion because Americans were largely against the conflict. They saw it as a pointless conflict with European empires who they did not favor at all. Public opinion leaned more towards Britain, but Americans largely were against the war. With these two events, he could avoid telling the whole truth and sway opinion. Would, uh, would Americans have been easier, easier to sway if Wilson said the Germans sunk a civilian ship, killing many innocent people aboard, like he said, or the truth, which was the British were using civilian ships to smuggle arms in partnership with American arms manufacturers, a violation of international law, despite our neutrality. Which of these sounds more convincing? Or saying that the Zimmerman telegram states that if we declare war on Germany, Germany wants Mexico to declare war on us, instead of saying originally, Germany wants Mexico to declare war on us. If it wasn't democracy, the Lusitania, unrestricted submarine warfare, or the Zimmerman telegram, what was it? Here is the real reason Wilson pushed for the US to enter the war. As we look at this chart, we can see that the interest on UK national debt and percentage of GDP, gross domestic product, in 1915 to 1918 was much higher than even in World War II. The reality is American banks had loaned the British billions of dollars in today's standards. Britain was heavily in debt to the United States, and this is why they kept trying to drag the US into, the, into their war. American banks feared that the British were going to lose, and this was a huge possibility. But many, many people are wondering, why are they going to lose the war all of a sudden? Germany had the biggest army in Europe, besides the Russian army, who was its second too. The Germans, Ger the Central Powers had pretty much defeated Russia on the Eastern Front by spring 1917. Russia was in the middle of a civil war, with Nicholas II already being abdicated. People were starving in Russia, and the army often did not even have boots for its troops. Russia was going to pull out of the war, it was only a matter of time. It did not officially until March 1918 with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, pulling Russia out of the war. Russia's last offensive in July 1917, the Kerensky Offensive, was a military disaster. Russia would not launch any more uh, major offensives for the rest of the war. The reason this had American banks panicking was that if Russia pulled out of the war, Germany would take all of its troops from the Eastern Front and put them on the Western Front, greatly outnumbering the British and the French. Germany could have possibly won the war here. The banks knew if Britain lost, their empire would most likely collapse due to Germany taking many of its colonies, and their economy would go down even more, possibly into an early depression. 
If Britain lost to Germany, it would not be able to pay back the American banks. So you see where this is going. If the American banks were not paid, they would have lost billions of dollars, causing them to go bankrupt and destroying the American economy alongside with them. What sounds better? Let's go to war for democracy and protect the world versus let's go to war for a bunch of greedy banks. I know a lot of people are probably shocked. I did not learn any of this in middle school, high school, or college. It's not until I started doing my own research into the war that I discovered this. Our view of the war in the United States is largely lied about or the whole story is not told. If you're an American viewer and you learn about the war in school, question your teacher if they tell you in class that Lusitania was sunk by the Germans and they completely forget to mention all the ammunition on board or the starvation blockade of Germany or the Zimmerman telegram. When I argued with college professors on World War I, they told me I was right, but I was going too much into detail. They said we just need to learn the basics of the war. How is this going too much into detail? The Lus Lusitania was carrying arms in a civilian ship. That's a big deal. That's a violation of international law. The Zimmerman telegram stating stating for Mexico to attack the United States only if the U.S. declares war on Germany versus Germany wants Mexico to invade America. That's a big deal. That's not small details. That's big deals. Both of those are, events are lied about. The reason that we go to war should always be a good reason and very important. We should never go to war for a reason that we're unsure of and we should never be lied to about the reasons we're going to war. No details should ever be left out about why we go to war. This goes for any country. So now we come to the end of our World War I investigation. I had to explain the motives and reasons each major country had for getting involved in the war. Now based off everything that I have told you guys, who did it? Who is responsible? Who caused World War I? Because someone messed up. 17 million people died in this war with 38 million casualties. Who caused this stupid war? Was it Austria-Hungary for invading Serbia? Or was it Germany for encouraging them to invade? Or were the conspiracies true, and did the Serbian government help with the assassination of Franz Duke Ferdinand? Or was it Russia for refusing to demobilize and escalating the conflict, bringing France in? Or was it France for being aggressive with Germany and pushing a war after their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War? Or was it the British for being aggressive with Germany, escalating the conflict and supporting France's push for war? Or finally, was there some other unknown factor that we did not discuss? Based off everything that I have told you guys, think carefully and make your decision now. Who is responsible for World War I? I will give everyone 30 seconds to decide before I give you my opinion. That question was a trick question. If you chose any of the countries listed before, you were wrong. It was not who caused World War I, but instead, everyone did. That's right, every country was responsible. Both the Central Powers and the Triple Entente caused this war. In my view, no side is more responsible than the other. Every major con country in this conflict had some role in starting and instigating this. Countries like the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, Japan, Italy, while they were not there right at the start of the conflict, they helped contribute into making the war what it was, a world war. They escalated it and made the war even worse. Even the United States did so by entering the war and making it even bigger. World War I goes back decades before the conflict even started. After the Franco-Prussian War, with the emergence of Germany as a country, France and Britain felt threatened as well as Russia. For centuries, the French and British were mortal enemies, but they unified against Germany, who they saw as a greater threat. There was a Cold War going on in Europe in the years leading up to the war. The reason that countries had become so advanced in tech in the years leading up to the war was militarism and aggression with one another. Blind patriotism also fueled hate for European powers. People believed my country was better than your country. The British had built one of the most advanced navies in the world. Their navy was equipped with destroyers, dreadnoughts. Germany, in response, built up its U-boat submarine fleet and set up a huge army. France, who was already aggressive with Germany, built up a huge army directly against Germany. This Cold War was not communism versus the Free West, but instead it was empire versus empire, alliance versus alliance. They wanted a war with each other and were trying to provoke one another. What many people do not understand is the assassination of Ferdinand was only the spark of the war. 
It was not the cause of the war. I am fully confident this war would have happened even if the assassination never took place. It would have started over another stupid reason. The assassination in Sarajevo was the excuse everyone was looking for. That's right. If the assassination never happened, this war would have still happened. They all wanted to tear each other apart, but why? Why were they trying so hard to start a war with each other? While every country has blame, what is the reason? What is the main cause of this war? The main cause of this war is summed up in one word. Empire. Empire caused this war. Here, look at this map of Africa from before World War I. As you can see here, Africa, as only one example, is almost completely colonized. Every country ranging from France, Britain, Germany to Belgium have colonies in Africa. European empires began expanding in Asia at this time as well, and if they were successful, would have done the same thing to Asia. Japan, in response, created their own empire to counter European empires. Countries like Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, the Ottoman Empire, and Russia, while they did not have colonies in Africa, had territory they controlled that was not theirs in Europe and the Middle East. Austria-Hungary occupied various territories that were not theirs. These included Polish lands, Croatian, Slovenian, Czech, Slovakia, and Romania, etc. The Ottomans throughout history occupied Greece as well as many Balkan lands such as Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Albania, Macedonia, and Bulgaria. They also occupied Arab lands in the Middle East as well as lands in the Caucasus such as Armenia. Their empire declined and they were kicked out of mainland Europe in the First Balkan War. Russia occupied various peoples in Central Asia, as well as Eastern Europe. This included Kazakhs, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Poles, Ukrainians, Lithuanians. Bulgaria tried to take over Macedonia with the other Balkan League members in the First Balkan War, but got greedy and lost in the Second Balkan War. They demanded more land and tried to take land from Serbia. Italy and Japan did the same thing. Italy claimed it had stolen lands from the Austro-Hungarians when in reality they had minimal claim to these lands. Many of them they stole and oppressed Slavic peoples on, as well as Austrians. All of these greedy empires wanted more land, more colonies, it was not enough for them, like feeding a monster that never is full. In this documentary, I did not defend any countries, but I defended historical truth. I explained the reasons each country had for going to war. For people who accused me of defending the German Empire, I did not. I hated the German Empire just as much as the French, British, and Russian, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman Empires. Screw all the empires. The Germans were not a force for good, and my ancestors the Poles were occupied and oppressed by them, as well as Russia and Austria-Hungary. I see the British and the French and the Russians being just as bad as the Ottomans, Germans, and Austro-Hungarians. They all wanted empire, it was not enough for them. Germany, while it did not want a war against Russia, was hoping France would intervene. They wanted a war of France in hopes of taking more land from France and expanding their empire. The French were furious at the Germans for their defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, and wanted to make Germany pay and take their empire from them. The British were hoping for more empire and wanted to take Germany's colonies in Africa as well as the Ottoman colonies in the Middle East. The Austro-Hungarians were using the assassination as an excuse to try to take over all of Serbia. They wanted to make an example out of Serbia. The Russians wanted to expand further in the East and Central Europe and Tsar Nicholas II was determined to make an example of Germany and Austria-Hungary to reinforce Russia's strength in the world after his humiliating defeat in the Russo-Japanese War. Japan wanted to take Germany's colonies in Asia, building their own empire. As we looked at the motives of all these countries, they all wanted empire. That was their reason for entering the war. More empire. I have always said it, and I will say it again. Empire is evil. I don't care if it's British Empire, French Empire, German, Ottoman, Japanese, Italian, Bulgarian, Russians, etc. All of it is bad. These countries made their wealth on oppressing and occupying people who, who they had no right to, and they wanted more of it. The victims of this war were the average citizen of these empires, as well as the colonial troops who fought for them. Many people were brainwashed into believing their empires were the best, and a force for good. There is nothing wrong with loving your country, but there is something wrong with supporting your country, invading and occupying other countries, and defending your government on every level. The average German, Brit, French, Russian, Italian, Austro-Hungarian did not benefit at all from these empires. In fact, most of their armies were poor working class people. They did not benefit at all from these empires they fought for. The worst case was for colonial troops, and this was for all the occupied people. My people, the Poles for instance, were drafted into the Russian, German, and Austro-Hungarian empires. All empires that occupied and oppressed them. They could have killed each other on the battlefield for these stupid empires they were serving in. Half of Austria-Hungary's army were conquered conquered peoples, the most of any European empire. Out of every 1,000 enlisted men, there were 267 Germans, 223 Hungarians, 135 Czechs, 85 Poles, 
81 Ukrainians, 60, 67 Croats and Serbs, 64 Romanians, 38 Slovaks, 26 Slovenians, and 14 Italians. These people who were occupied were forced to fight for their occupiers, and these battles were often on their own soil. Colonial troops from Asia and Africa were used by these empires, mostly by the French and the British. Britain relied on many Indian troops, while France relied on troops from its colonies in Africa. 1.3 million Indians served in the British Empire's army, hoping that they would get independence. The majority of these were volunteers. The British government promised the Indians more self-government if they won, and 70,000 had died in the war. The British broke their promise, and refused to give the Indians greater role in governing themselves after the war. The French used their own colonial troops as well, which was 475,000 troops mostly from Africa. Germany also had its own colonial troops, numbering around 80,000, mostly fighting in the African theater of World War I. So not only were people like Poles, Czechoslovakians, Croats, Ukrainians, Slovenians, Africans, Indians having their lands occupied by these empires, their resources stolen, but they were also fighting and dying for their oppressors. The British and French also promised Arab rebels independence from the Ottomans during the Arab Revolt, which is portrayed in Battlefield 1. Even though the rebels defeated the Ottomans and won their freedom, the British and the French broke their word. Britain carved up a land called Iraq, and France carved up a land called Syria as their new colonies. That's right. That's where the modern Syria and Iraq came from. They were created as colonies of Britain and France after World War I. World War I had a total of 17 million deaths with 38 million casualties. The war had some of the most brutal fighting with trench warfare, gas, flamethrowers, modern artillery, planes used for the first time, and also tanks entering the war. Many people who survived gas, for instance, were paralyzed, disfigured, or blind. Today in 2018, almost 100 years later, we talk about a lot of stupid and pointless wars in human history. This war takes the cake for the most pointless war ever fought in human history. World War II had an important point to fight in it. It was to liberate the world from the Axis powers and stop them. What was the point in World War I? This war had no goal, no objective. It was just plain stupid. A bunch of greedy empires fighting each other for more empire, more colonies. Because of their greed, they caused millions of people to lose their lives, destroyed entire countries. Who benefited from this suffering? It was the monarchies and the aristocrats from each of their empires. While France lost its monarchy in the Franco-Prussian War, it still had much of its aristocracy who pushed this war. In Germany, it was the Kaiser and his aristocracy, and the same was in Russia with the Tsar, the Sultan in the Ottoman Empire, and King George and the aristocracy in Britain, the Tsar in Bulgaria, the King in Italy, the Emperor in Japan. They all wanted war to expand their empires, at the cost of everyone in their way. These aristocrats were so out of touch with modern technology that they fought the, when the war first started, it would be fought standing in the fields, firing in lines at each other. What fools! They didn't realize how deadly weapons could evolve. 30 years before, before World War I, you would have thousands of people dying in a few days of fighting. During World War I, you have thousands of people dying in one day. The fools did not realize what they had caused. In the case of the United States, it was the banks and the arms industry that benefited from this terrible war. If all of these empires caused the war, then why was Germany blamed at the Treaty of Versailles? Very simple, because Germany was the loser. It's a lot easier to blame Germany than to take responsibility for your role in the war, something Britain and France refused to do. Germany had most definitely contributed to causing this war and was an aggressor. But what they don't tell you is France and Britain were just as much aggressors as well as Russia. They were just as bad as Germany. Germany was completely punished, their empire dissolved, along with the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian Empire. They were forced to pay huge reparations, rep reparations, and during the Depression, their economy collapsed. This led to the Nazis taking power in Germany so easily. Russia, on the other hand, with the collapse of their empire, led to the creation of the Soviet Union. Both of these countries, Germany and the Soviet Union, were the results of failed empires, and they would go on to destroy the world 20 years later, causing millions of deaths. The Japanese Empire, additionally, would go on to conquer the majority of East Asia in the next 25 years, killing millions of people. Instead of dissolving the German, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman Empire, every single empire should have been dissolved. The French, British, Italian, along with the Japanese Empire should have all been dissolved. If all empires ceased to exist after the war, and everyone took full responsibility for their actions and worked together towards a better future, there would have been peace on Earth. 
Instead, punishing Germany, they led to the creation of a monster, and the Russian Empire, with the cruel treatment of its people, led to the Soviet Union, another monster. There is no reason that this war should have started. Instead of countries trying to resolve the conflict before it boils down to full-scale war, they pushed it. These alliances were meant to prevent war, but on the other hand caused it. A small loophole managed to trigger the events of World War I. The idea was that no country would attack another country in these major alliances. The problem here is that there was nothing against countries in these alliances having separate alliances with other nations. Russia had a separate alliance with Serbia. Serbia was not a member of the Triple Entente. Germany encouraged Austria-Hungary to invade Serbia, thinking Russia would not interfere. When Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, Russia mobilized. And then Germany declared war on Russia, which caused France to declare war on Germany, and the Ottomans declared war on France, Britain, and Russia because of their alliance with Germany. As you can see, World War I was a giant mess, and the most stupid war in human history. It is a strange war, because usually in war there is an aggressor, but here everyone was the aggressor. Everyone had equal blame. Think of World War I as both a baseball and hockey team. What happens when two players from opposing teams start fighting? Usually all the other players jump in and fight the other team to back their teammate up, as we see a lot on TV and hockey and baseball. World War I can be best described as two gangs that represent both alliances. Neither of these gangs are good people. Both of them are thugs. They intimidate and push each other around, and they push smaller peoples around, just like bullies. One day, one gang member goes up to a rival gang member and taunts them. The other member attacks him in response. Now both gangs jump in and fight each other. Whose fault is it? The gang member who started taunting, or the one who threw the first punch? Need neither. If the second gang had backed off and hadn't punched, it would not have started. And the first gang member, if they had not instigated the fight by taunting them, it would not have happened either. World War I was basically, my empire is better than your empire, and so forth. Not every people that fought in this war were aggressors, however. Countries such as Belgium had no role in the war, but they did have their own empire. Other peoples such as colonial peoples in Africa and Asia and occupied peoples in Europe were forced to fight for their occupying empires as we covered before. The aristocrats and the monarchies didn't care who they dragged in this stupid war. It didn't matter whose home they destroyed or who they got killed. All they cared about was their family name and bringing glory and com in combat and fame to their house. For centuries, the aristocracy of Europe had often abused the peasantry in their countries. Not all of them were like this, but many were. It's what originally caused the Enlightenment in Europe to get away from aristocratic power, but the aristocracy never truly lost power until after World War I. If you were a lower class, these people could care less about you. They thought that they were smarter and superior to you in every way simply because of their family name. People of lower class were not even deemed worthy to speak to them. They often denied poorer people equal rights and education to attend universities. Military academies were often reserved only for aristocrats. These people were so out of touch with how much technology had advanced that they thought when the war first started, armies would meet in the fields and fire at each other in lines. Generals at this time were often in their 70s, even going into their 80s. As an example, parachutes were developed years before World War I. Yet many pilots did not have them because aristocratic generals thought they were dishonorable. After the British had developed the first tank, aristocrats in Germany did not want to build tanks to counter them, believing they were dishonorable, riding around in giant metal machines as they called them. This is how stupid these aristocrats were. They were completely out of touch with technology, and they caused this war along with the monarchies. The fools had no idea what kind of war they started. 17 million people died. 38 million casualties, entire countries obliterated, and for what? More empire and colonies. All those people on all sides died for absolutely nothing. They died for the greed of these stupid monarchies. As Battlefield 1 says, World War I was the war to end all wars. It accomplished nothing. As we go back and we look the, to the initial spark of the war, Gavrilo Princip, the man who was responsible for the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, was only 19 years old at the time of it. This was a teenager, a young adult. Many of the members of the plot were his age. At trial, Princip stated the aristocracy's treatment of the peasantry was one factor in his decision to kill Ferdinand. He was asked at, how tri at trial how people were suffering. He said as quote, that they are completely impoverished that they are treated like cattle, the peasant is impoverished, they destroy him completely. I am a villager's son, and I know how it is in the villages, therefore I wanted to take revenge, and I am not sorry. Princip was not even given the death penalty, instead 20 years of hard labor, because he was 19 at the time of the assassination, and under Austrian law, someone under 20 cannot be executed. Princip died 
on April 20, 28, 1918, aged 23 from tuberculosis in prison. I wonder what his reaction was to the war that he set into motion. While Gavrilo Princip and the Black Hand were not the cause of the war, they were the spark. Ironically, these mighty empires were brought down by a bunch of teenagers, young adults, who were sick of the Austro-Hungarian Empire's occupation of Bosnia. One of the occupied and oppressed peoples fought back against the empire. Some people see him as a hero, others a terrorist. You should decide as the viewer on what you think, but the fact is, the people who he shot were not good people at all, and he and his friends had legitimate grievances with the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Ironically though, while parts of Bosnia would have wanted to join Serbia, others would have not, and would want to be their own country, Bosnia instead. As for Serbia, and their role in the war, it is still unknown if the government was involved, but there is no doubt that many Serbians celebrated the assassination, and parts of the government were happy. As we close our segment on World War I, it is very unfortunate many people do not know much about this war, and people that do know about this war might have been misled. As I stated earlier, people should know the real reason for the war. It was not the assassination, but the greed and arrogance of the elite of all the empires. They should know about how these stupid alliances caused this terrible war. This was, this was an idiotic war fought by stupid people on all sides. While I strongly believe a situation like World War II will never happen, a situation like World War I could still happen today. I do not think a situation will ever happen where a group of countries are going to attempt to conquer the world, such as in Europe and Asia, like during World War II. I do not want to scare anyone, but a situation like World War I is still possible today. If World War III would ever happen, even though it's unlikely, it wouldn't be between superpowers at first. Instead, it would start as a stupid dispute, conflict between two smaller, weaker nations, such as in World War I. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was not a strong empire, and it was becoming weaker, and Serbia was a small country. Again, I, not, I do not want to scare anyone. But as we look to the world today, where there are conflicts between smaller nations, we can look to the war in Syria. A civil war has been going on for the past seven years. Turkey has been supporting its own rebels in the region, while the US has as, as well. Russia has been supporting the government of Syria, while a third party ISIS, a terrorist group, is fighting everyone. What would happen if, for example, ISIS caused a terrorist attack in Turkey, and these terrorists were from Syria? And then Turkey, in response, chooses to invade the rest of Syria. What could happen? Well, if this happened, Russia would respond and declare war on Turkey, because Syria is Russia's ally, Russia's only real ally in the Middle East. Russia has military bases in Syria, and would not let Syria fall to Turkey. If Russia attacked Turkey, then NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, would respond with which Turkey is a member of. NATO composes as an alliance of most of the West, with the United States, Britain, France, Italy, Germany, Poland as examples. NATO policy is an attack on one member, is an attack on all members. Russia, on the other hand, has its own alliance called the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is an alliance of Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, T Tajikistan. Even though the CSTO has been ineffective in the past, if a member such as Russia, its lead, would be thrown into a war, they would be forced to help. All of the NATO countries could jump in, while Russia and the CSTO would also. You see how these alliances could cause it to happen again? These alliances are dangerous, it could cause a huge trigger of war. NATO is constantly expanding, even after the Cold War ended, and while Russia has also been doing its own expansions, especially in Central Asia, if you look at it from Russia's view, they feel threatened by the buildup of the alliance. CSTO was a response to NATO still remaining after the Cold War. Now I am not attacking Russia, and I'm not attacking Turkey in this example. But this is a scary example of how a situation like World War I could start again. You see how these alliances can trigger a giant war with one stupid dispute between two smaller nations? It would drag all the superpowers into it. Another, another example is China and North Korea having the Sino-Korean Mutual Aid and Cooperation Friendship Treaty. China has a military alliance with North Korea and an obligation to defend it only if it is attacked first. North and South Korea have a conflict with one another. What would happen if a dispute happened on the DMZ, the border between the two? Soldiers opened fire on each other, and it wasn't clear who initiated it. A war would start, and North Korea would blame South Korea as the aggressor. China would most likely not act on North Korea's behalf, but you never know. That is what is scary. If war happened, the US would support South Korea as ally, while China might support North Korea. You never know. You see how these alliances could be a catalyst for disaster? In World War I, 17 million people died over four years, but today, the risk is even greater with nuclear weapons. 
While 17 million people died in four years, 17 million people could die today in one day. The risk today is even greater than before. And if it happens again, we would not survive to learn our lesson this time. And that concludes this World War I documentary. I hope that you guys have enjoyed it. If you watched until this point, I thank you very much. World War I was a terrible war. And I made this documentary to teach Battlefield 1 players who love the game, but may not have known much about the war. This war was a giant mess that could have been completely prevented, but started over such stupid reasons. It stole the lives of 17 million people and ruined millions of people's lives who were crippled, blinded, and paralyzed because of this idiotic conflict. It had no objective, and soldiers on both sides had no idea what they were even fighting for. We look to the world today and hope that a conflict like World War I will never happen again, and that those, these modern alliances will not destroy our world like the alliances in 1914 did. Hopefully World War I remains the most pointless war in human history, and something terrible and worse never replaces it. That is the end of this documentary. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. Again, I am sorry for this taking so long. It was the largest project I have ever done. Any historical questions down below, and I will try to answer. I will see you guys in the next one. Take care, everyone. Thank you for watching.